Gator Grip was a very successful product. Like I said, for 20 years, we sold millions and millions of pieces. It was on Direct Response TV. It sold all over the world. And in the United States, we did a great job of keeping competitors out of the market because our patents were strong. And they were strong because they covered very specific, very clear, very easily understood details. And in the case of Gator Grip, what that meant is this. And I'm going to go into a bit of detail here. The Gator Grip has 54 steel pins. So you have 54 steel pins, these little pins here, okay? And they fit any size nut or bolt, okay? You can fit thousands of nuts or bolts without having a whole socket set. That's the whole deal with Gator Grip. Is you've got this, this one socket does the work of an entire socket set. We did different sizes, by the way. So we have this bigger one, and there's even a monster one that was used for water companies. The way the Gator Grip worked is that each one of those pins, and they're 54, has a little spring behind the base of it, okay, on the, on the tail of it. And that tail has a, like an arrowhead at the very bottom. Okay, the arrowhead has a flange to it. And that arrowhead with the spring is pushed through a plastic plate, a little hole in a plastic plate. The plastic expands a little bit, the arrow goes through, and then it sticks once it gets through. And then the, the part's going to go in and out. What one of the patent claims was a very important one was the use of a plastic plate for the pin matrix to put all those pins through. So you can imagine, if you have an assembly machine, which we did an automatic machine, you could push those pins through automatically, one by one, and create that plate very quickly. Okay, that's a really important claim for making the thing in high production at low cost. The other key claim was that there's a notch in the sidewall of the socket. So you could take that full batch of pins, okay, and then just jam it down in the socket, and then it would eventually sit in place in this uh, cutout in the side of the socket. And so that made, again, for very, very quick assembly. The other good thing about the plastic plate is that if the pins ever got stuck on something and you dislodged one, you could just push it back in place and the Gator Grip worked good as new. The last piece of it, which was actually kind of cool, is there are these little ridges in here. Uh, it's hard to see, but there's little ridges in the sides, little, little ridges in the sides. So as the socket shifts, the pins kind of roll up and grip down. So it created actually a gripping action, a cam action. So those three patents are what made the Gator Grip so good. And everyone who went to knock us off, they had the ability to make a socket with pins that fit any size nut or bolt. But if they didn't use our patents, they'd have a product that cost more and that didn't work as well. And it's because our patent covered the lowest cost, best way of making a high quality product that, and it was easy to explain and easy to see that we could defend it so effectively when it came time to talk to people about knockoffs. And we kept everybody out of the market, like I said, for 20 years. And we collected royalties for 20 years because of that. I want to talk to you about a second product called the squeeze driver. It's got a great story of how, how patents can work. So first off, the squeeze driver is a squeeze tire screwdriver. You squeeze it and it turns. Okay, you squeeze it and, and a bit turns here in the end. We sold close to a million of these things, including some uh, through licensing deals and such around the world. It was knocked off uh, pretty badly in China, but in the U.S. we actually maintained our patents reasonably well for a good period of time. Uh, what was cool about this product is this, is, is, it, is it, it got an award from Popular Science for Tools, it was written up in the Wall Street Journal, it got awards uh, in Japan, it was, uh, we sold it to Napa as a private label, uh, I went on QVC with it a dozen times, it's, it was even sold by Sears, it was tested by Home Depot, it was even sold, uh, I shouldn't say sold, it was even used by John, John Hopkins at Johns Hopkins University in brain surgery. And NASA took a look at it. So this is a very, and people are still looking at it. It's a really cool product. Uh, the thing with the squeeze driver, though, is that for a while there, we did a DRTV thing. So we had a two-minute spot running. First, we tried a 30-minute infomercial with it. Uh, that didn't work. And then uh, a company we licensed it to did a two-minute direct response TV spot, which kind of sort of worked. And that caused uh, another company to try and knock us off, okay, to actually create a knockoff. So here's the story. I'm at the National Hardware Show, walking the hardware show, and I come across this booth by a company called KTEL. KTEL was in the TV business as well. And they had an exact knockoff of our squeeze driver. Okay, They had a squeeze, a squeeze power screwdriver. This is the same tool, just in yellow. So they had this tool, and it looked almost identical. And, I, and I, my first instinct was, let me find a sledgehammer from one of the booths around here and just start just pounding them to bits. Because I, I, you know, your, your blood boils, you see red, you start going crazy. These guys are stealing from me, right? I walked away after telling, you know, I yelled at them at first and said, hey, you got to take this down. Then I walked away and I came back and I came back the second time, much calmer, and I had a copy of our pad with us. And I called the general manager from KTEL over and I said, listen, we don't own the exclusive right to a squeeze power screwdriver. 
squeeze power of the screwdriver, squeezing and, and turning, that's known in prior art. So if you want to make a product, a squeeze powered screwdriver that does this action, squeezes and turns, be my guest, okay? But what you can't have in that is this curved lever. See this curved lever here? This curved lever, which goes behind, is, is critical to the making this thing work really well. Okay, what it does is it keeps the forces in line so it doesn't jam up, and it also has these two areas. There's two areas of torque. So this is high torque in the first area and then high speed in the second area. So that's what the patent covers. The pat the really cool parts of the patent cover the secondary lever and the curve in that lever, and that's part of why the product works so well. So it made it a great tool. So I said to the guy at KTEL, I said, you can make this product without that lever. It'll function well enough, and you don't really care about quality. You want a low-cost product that you can just pitch on TV. And he said, you're right. I said, so you can save some money. Take this thing off the market now. Don't knock us off directly. We can all avoid court. We don't have to go to court. We don't have to go into the whole patent enforcement thing. You just take it off the market. You make something without that curved lever. I'll tell everyone we're involved with it. We're all cool that we're not going to go after you. We'll give you permission to do it. And everyone can be happy. And he said, thank you very much for having such a, a professional attitude. He took his product off the market for a year. They came back a year later with the product exactly the way that we needed it to be without that curved lever, and it failed. <laughs> it, was really, it was a great outcome for us, and it was actually good for him because we all avoided court. So that's how patents can work. In other words, the point here is we had the very specific detail on the squeeze driver covered, this curved lever, okay, and that enabled us to enforce the patent just by having a discussion because I could point to the patent that we had issued, point to the specific detail and say, here, you can get around our patent by doing this other design. It's an inferior design, but you're around our patent. So go ahead and do that and we can all be happy. And that actually worked. There are other cases where we haven't had that much success, where we actually had to go to court and we had to fight all the way through uh, you know, federal court and through uh, appeals, and that was a $5 million plus process, which I wouldn't wish on anyone, okay? But patents work that way too, and the fact that we had that fight is part of why we're still collecting royalties on that product, which I don't want to talk about right now, because it's still an active product. But the point is, you can go that way too. It's not always so pretty, but without patents, we wouldn't have made any money at all, and that's, that's the story I wanted to tell. And, and there's one last story I'll tell you, which is, which is regarding the uh, Power Shot staple gun. So uh, the first licensing deal we did was with Black & Decker for the Power Shot staple gun. And it's a, it's a staple gun where you push to the front and the staple comes out the front. And so we had a, a, we'd spent a long time, a couple years, you know, developing this thing. And we finally are going to our first meeting with Black & Decker and, and getting into that meeting. I tell the whole story at InventionCity.com. But anyway, we're getting into that meeting there and we've got an NDA in place. And they ha we have the NDA in place because Black & Decker thought we were going to show them a version of the squeeze driver. <laughs> um, so that's why they agreed to the NDA, because we'd had the squeeze driver out there and said, oh, okay, we kind of get where this is going. They didn't get exactly where it was going because it was a forward action staple gun. And we had seen, and this is where it's interesting, we looked at the patent record and we'd seen a patent issued to Black & Decker for some staple gun. And we said, ah, you know, it's whatever. It seemed to cover some detail that wasn't very important. We didn't think they'd ever heard of a forward action staple gun. I mean, there were some, again, like in all these stories, there were some, there were some other forward action staple guns in the patent record, but nothing like ours, certainly nothing current and nothing on the market. And we'd never heard of anyone ever selling one on the market. So we arrived at our first meeting with Black & Decker. We showed them our forward action staple gun. They thought it was really cool. They went back in the closet and they pull out a forward action staple gun that they had tried to bring to market like four or five years earlier. And it was just badly designed. It was a horrible design and it didn't work. But our jaws just dropped. It was like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, we're sitting here thinking, we've got this thing. They've never seen it before. And they come out with a forward action staple gun. And the whole premise of this thing was that Arrow, who was the leader, you push to the back, staple comes out the front, you know, that chrome staple gun. We turned it around. We, our whole tagline was, you know, after 50 years of going in the wrong direction, we put the forces aligned, it's in the right direction. They understood that message and they got it. The good thing is, because they got that message, is why they went ahead and actually did the deal, which is a whole other story that I don't want to get into, but the point is, our patents covered the best way of making a forward action staple gun. Once again, having the best way of making something is how you can get a long-term patent. And in all of these deals, for the Gator Grip, for the Squeeze Driver, uh, and for especially for the Power Shop, 
we got royalties for 20 years, okay, for, for Gator Grip and for PowerShot. 20 years of royalties, which would not have been possible without patents. You can make money without having a patent. You don't have to have a patent to have an invention and get royalties. But if you want to collect meaningful royalties over a long period of time, patents are absolutely necessary.